This video is about Long QT syndrome, a condition affecting the electrical activity of the heart. Included in this video is an overview of the etiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment of this condition. Hello, my name is Dr. Shubayan Sanitani, and I'm a pediatric cardiac electrophysiologist at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. I specialize in the care of children and families with cardiac arrhythmias including inherited arrhythmia conditions. This group of uncommon disorders came to be known because they have the potential to cause sudden unexpected death in young, apparently healthy individuals. In the absence of structural heart disease, long QT syndrome is the most common cause of sudden unexpected death in the young. Long QT syndrome is known as an ion channelopathy, an abnormality of the proteins that control the movement of ions in and out of heart cells. Although we have known about Long QT syndrome for nearly 60 years, we still continue to learn much about this condition, and diagnosis remains a challenge. Before we can understand Long QT syndrome, it is necessary to review the normal electrophysiology of the heart. The heart has four chambers, two that collect the blood, the atria, and two that pump blood, the ventricles. The heart beats spontaneously due to well-developed cellular mechanisms. The electrocardiogram, or ECG, records the heart's electrical activity at the body surface. The normal heartbeat exhibits a P wave due to atrial depolarization, a QRS complex due to ventricular depolarization, and a T wave from ventricular repolarization. It is the time interval from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave that gives rise to the term QT interval. Now let's look more closely at what happens at the cellular level. When a heart cell is stimulated, the electrical potential opens sodium channels in the cell membrane. This causes positively charged sodium ions to flow into the cell, making the inside less negative. As a result, intracellular stores of calcium ions are released within the cell, causing the heart muscle cells to contract. The change in membrane potential caused by the influx of sodium ions will open voltage-dependent potassium channels. Efflux of potassium from the cell will produce a repolarization, returning the membrane potential to its normal negative value. This resets the membrane for the next signal. Although there are several ion channels and currents underlying the cardiac action potential, Long QT syndrome is primarily a disorder of potassium and sodium channels. Now that we have an understanding of normal cardiac depolarization and repolarization, let's continue on to our discussion of Long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome can be either congenital or acquired. The main focus of this video will be on congenital LQTS. It is important to recognize that there are also acquired forms of the disorder, caused by a variety of conditions, most commonly medications, systemic illness, and metabolic disturbances. Congenital Long QT syndrome is an inherited condition that occurs in roughly 1 in 2,500 individuals. Most forms of congenital LQTS are autosomal dominant, meaning that a person with the condition has a 50% chance of passing it on to their children. There is a rare form of long QT syndrome that is inherited as an autosomal recessive condition, in which case an abnormal gene is passed on from both parents. It should be noted that over 10% of LQTS cases arise from de novo mutations. In LQTS, there is a mutation in one of the genes encoding for one of the ion channels required for action potential generation. A single nucleotide substitution in the DNA can change the amino acid sequence of the protein, which in turn alters the structure of the ion channel, resulting in the production of a mutated product. The abnormal ion channel may result in reduced expression on the cell membrane or a gain or loss of function. 
This leads to prolongation of the action potential seen on the ECG as a prolonged QT interval. There are numerous ion channel proteins responsible for action potential generation, and there are at least 10 genes involved in long QT syndrome. There are a variety of mutations within these genes that can cause LQTS. However, mutations in three of these channels account for over 90% of known causes of LQTS. In the top image, we see a representation of a normal heart and the corresponding ECG reading. The lower image shows a heart with LQTS and its ECG reading with a prolonged QT interval. Under normal conditions, the heartbeat in the presence of long QT syndrome is not mechanically different from a normal heart, despite the difference in electrical activity. Therefore, at rest, both hearts beat normally. When an LQTS heart with ion channel dysfunction and resulting prolonged QT interval is exposed to certain triggers, it is susceptible to early after depolarizations, which can lead to a specific type of ventricular arrhythmia known as torsade de pointe. There can be specific triggers for different types of LQTS. For example, in LQTS1, swimming is an important trigger. LQTS2 events can be triggered by loud auditory stimuli such as a telephone ringing or an alarm going off. Events in LQTS3 usually occur at rest. Torsade de Pointe is named for the characteristic appearance of a rotating QRS axis on ECG reading. This abnormal rhythm can lead to syncope, seizures, or cardiac arrest and without treatment may progress to ventricular fibrillation. It is important to remember that long QT syndrome may be asymptomatic and may only be detected on a routine ECG or on the basis of a family history. Therefore, a heightened index of suspicion must be present whenever assessing young individuals for this diagnosis. Symptoms that patients may present with include syncope, palpitations, and seizures. These are common complaints and can be caused by a variety of medical conditions. Syncope and seizures that occur during exertion or after an auditory stimulus should prompt a careful evaluation for long QT syndrome. For example, a person who experiences a seizure after their alarm clock goes off needs to be evaluated for long QT syndrome. In the presence of a family history of sudden unexpected death, long QT syndrome is an important diagnosis. The physical examination and echocardiogram are usually normal in congenital long QT syndrome. Diagnosing LQTS depends on accurate interpretation of the ECG. Sometimes multiple ECGs are needed to make the diagnosis as the QT interval varies with heart rate, autonomic tone, time of day, and body position. ECG measurements from family members can also help in the diagnosis. Measuring the QT interval is essential in the diagnosis of long QT syndrome and in the evaluation of syncope, particularly syncope that occurs with activity or emotion. It is important to remember that the computer readout may not be accurate and may in fact be misleading, and therefore manual measurement of the QT interval is essential. Repeated measurements and serial electrocardiograms may be necessary to make the diagnosis. Accurate measurement of the QT interval requires an ECG readout, calipers, and a calculator with square root function. Measurements are usually made from leads 2 or V5. The QT interval is measured from the onset of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave, where it intersects with the isoelectric baseline. It is important to define the end of the T-wave correctly, as is shown in this diagram. It is essential to have a 12-lead ECG recorded under optimal settings, as baseline and movement artifact can interfere with correct interpretation. 
the manually derived QT interval should be corrected to account for heart rate. The corrected value is referred to as QTC and can be calculated using Bazet's formula. While a normal value for the QTC is less than 460 milliseconds, there are individuals with QTC values below this who have long QT syndrome, and individuals with values above this who do not. The challenge of QT measurement emphasizes the importance of taking a history and gathering ancillary information. As the use of genetic testing has increased, we have learned that at least one quarter of individuals harboring a long QT susceptibility mutation have a QT interval which is in the normal range. An exercise ECG in which the QT interval is measured during recovery from exercise can also be used in the workup of patients with suspected LQTS. Findings suggestive of LQTS include a lack of shortening of QTC and an abnormal T-wave morphology such as T-alternans and notched T-waves. Historically, physicians have calculated an LQTS score to determine the probability of a patient having LQTS. While a good screening tool in the absence of a larger pedigree, this method has largely been replaced by genetic testing, particularly in families with an identified mutation. Genetic testing involves screening a patient's DNA for mutations in the genes associated with LQTS. Genetic testing became commercially available in 2004 and is now considerably more accessible and affordable. However, approximately one quarter of patients with a clear clinical diagnosis of long QT syndrome will not have a genetic mutation identified on testing. The complexity and heterogeneity of the disease makes genetic testing a challenge and the low sensitivity of the test limits its applicability to all patients. It's also very important to offer genetic testing for the patient's first-degree relatives. Not all mutations are pathogenic, contributing to additional diagnostic confusion. By now, it is evident that it can be difficult to make a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. There can be severe consequences of both overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. Fortunately, there are several centers with expertise in these uncommon conditions who are willing to help. A list of resources is available at the end of this video. Once a diagnosis of LQTS has been made, the management and treatment of the condition become important aspects of patient care. The pillars of LQTS management include patient education, healthcare professional education, and medications. While important to be aware of, other forms of treatment are only necessary in a limited number of patients. Education and awareness are the most important aspects of LQTS management. Individuals with LQTS must be aware of the common triggers for their condition and be alert to any concerning symptoms they may experience. Some treatment guidelines for LQTS suggest the avoidance of competitive sports and strenuous activity. Physical activity is an essential part of a healthy lifestyle, and it is now thought that activity levels should not be restricted. Most importantly, those with LQTS should not be forced to continue an activity if they are feeling unwell, and should always be allowed to stop and rest when they feel the need. Swimming is an important trigger for LQTS and should only be performed when accompanied or supervised by a lifeguard. Family members and friends should be encouraged to maintain up-to-date CPR training. A medic alert device or similar notification is also advisable. For school-aged children, a discussion with teachers and administrators is often needed to dispel misunderstandings and provide guidance about the condition. Another aspect of patient education involves preparing the patient and their family for situations involving an unanticipated cardiac event. Familiarity with the location of automated external defibrillators within the community is advisable. Fortunately, cardiac arrest is rare once long QT syndrome has been recognized and diagnosed in a family. Because many individuals with long QT syndrome are asymptomatic, it can be difficult for them to accept their diagnosis. This can affect patient compliance with recommended treatments. 
Pharmacists, dentists, and other healthcare professionals involved in the care of those with LQTS should be aware of the diagnosis. Anesthesia for surgical procedures must be managed appropriately. For women, the postpartum period can be a time of increased risk and awareness for the healthcare provider, and complete follow up care is important. There are a wide variety of medications that can precipitate long QT syndrome. Over the counter and prescription drugs need to be reviewed carefully before use. In the case of medications known to prolong the QT interval, an alternative medication should be selected. When no other option is available, the physician should perform a risk-benefit assessment, use the minimum effective dose, and monitor the patient closely for signs and symptoms of prolonged QT interval. A list of medications to be aware of is maintained at the University of Arizona's QTdrugs.org. The mainstay of pharmacologic therapy for long QT syndrome is beta blockers. For the majority of patients, no further therapy will be required as beta blockers reduce the risk of torsade deploying significantly. Caution with concomitant medications is of course also important. Non-compliance with beta blocker medications can be a barrier to effective therapy. Missing doses can place the patient at higher risk of cardiac events and again emphasizes the importance of education and awareness. In the small group of patients who remain symptomatic despite beta blocker therapy, other treatment options are available. In the current era, many physicians choose to recommend an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, or ICD, if a device is indicated. An ICD is able to pace and defibrillate the heart in the presence of a dangerous arrhythmia. Complications of an ICD include infection, lead fracture, inappropriate discharges, and electrical storm. Permanent cardiac pacing or left stellate ganglionectomy may also be used as adjuncts to medical therapy. This video has provided an overview of long QT syndrome, its diagnosis, and management. It is important to be aware of long QT syndrome as recognition and appropriate management can be life-saving. With simple medication and lifestyle modification, individuals with long QT syndrome lead long and productive lives. Thank you for joining us.